this is our Advent season. In the last few weeks, we've been, we looked at hope, we looked at faith, and this week we're looking at joy. Joy. How many of you, man, sometimes just hard to find joy, or it seems that the world's lacking in it, and some of us, maybe you're different personalities and just constantly walking around full of joy and making other people sick, um, and so we're loving this holiday. But we're going to be looking at joy this morning, and, and just kind of our big idea as we go through this morning's text is this, happiness can come and go, but true joy is the divine result of knowing, trusting, and receiving the fullness of who Jesus is. Happiness can come and go, but the true joy is the divine result of knowing, trusting, and receiving the fullness of who Jesus is. As we talked about in Advent, that word meaning coming or return, we're, we're looking back at the promise that God fulfilled to send Christ into this world and to fulfill his promises. And in doing so, we're remembering and we're holding on to the fulfillment of that promise that Christ will return that he will make all things new. And so we can wait in hope because he fulfilled his promise. Those that waited in hope before received that promise. God's word is true and faithful, as we looked at last week, and does not fail. So this morning, as we start off looking at joy, we're going to start in Luke chapter 1, verse 39 through 55. We looked at part of that text above that last week. Starting verse 39. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. So this is after the angel has come to her and told her she would conceive. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And just to tell you, the child within uh, Elizabeth is going to be John the Baptist. It's Jesus' cousin. He's the one who's supposed to have that, that old prophetic spirit of Elijah. He's going to go before him into the wilderness and say, Hey, the Messiah is here. The Messiah is coming. So at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And some texts say leaped with joy. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Remember we talked about last week that, that faith and believing and trusting what God would do being the reason that Mary was picked, fulfilled the promise that was given to Abraham. Abraham wasn't picked because he was special. He was picked because he was faithful enough just to believe God. And Mary, she wasn't probably any special than any other girl, but she just simply believed God. Continuing on then, and we'll just kind of go through this, uh, verse 46 through 55 is then Mary's song of praise, or the Magnificat. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices, that, which means like to celebrate with joy, to be filled with joy, in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation, to all who fear or revere him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel, his people, and remembered to be merciful, for he made his promises to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. And I just love this picture. We see that Mary is obviously in this song filled with joy. 
Now, I think it's important we look at, at this picture. It's easy to look at that and go, oh, man, isn't that great? She's excited. She's filled with joy. What a great situation to be in. See, the thing is, Mary wasn't in a great situation right there. She was pregnant with a child that wasn't her fiance's. The reason she's at Elizabeth's is to get out of town and avoid all the scandal. So in the midst of this uncertain circumstance, this, un, this non-ideal circumstance, where she should be afraid and should be freaking out, and how many of you have had moments where God puts you in a situation where you're freaking out? You're like, God, I, this is beyond me. And in those moments... As we trust God and say, God, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'm trusting you. It's amazing that in that moment of trusting him, allowing that faith to rise, that all of a sudden we begin to have joy. And I think because partly we begin to realize the problems aren't ours to solve, that they're God's problems, that he's going to sort them out. And he, as Mary said, is always faithful. So Mary's in this difficult, some might even say dark situation. Mary doesn't have any answers to how this will work out yet, but she has joy because she trusts what God has said. And true joy doesn't come from having the answers. True joy doesn't come from knowing how every little, how many of you are control freaks? You like to know What's going to happen step by step? And I've learned that God does not let me know the full path because I'm smarter than God and I'll work out a, a shortcut to try to get there and he doesn't want me to do that. It's a, it's a joke. I'm not smarter than God. But we, we think that, right? We think, man, God, you know, this would be so much easier if this. I'm sure Mary was like, God, you know, this might be so much easier if, uh, you know, this lady over here had eight kids. Uh, she knows what she's doing. She's a pro. That might be easier. I'll, I'll come in and help. Let's do that. How many of you are like, God, no, not me. Let me just come in and help someone else birth what you're wanting to do. As we talked about last week, that, that God is calling all of us. He's wanting all of us to say yes to what he's wanting to do within us because there are things, his purposes, by his spirit, wanting to birth out of us, birth his light, birth Christ into the world around us. And it can seem scary, and we can try to figure all of that out, and God, in the end, is just saying, trust me. And as we trust him, as we allow ourselves to be positioned into his purposes and his will, it's amazing that his joy can fill us, even when we don't have all the answers. Another perspective I want us to see, and it's a perspective we don't always look at, Uh, mentioned much, but uh, the perspective of little baby John, little John, we'll call him little John. Some of you like rap music will get that. We'll call him little John. Little John is is in the womb, and and from what I can, I don't remember, but from what I know from science, it's pretty dark in there, you know, maybe if you shine a flashlight on the mother's belly, you can get a little light, but for the most part, there's this, this dark place. You have no idea what is going on in the world around you. You just have this dark clue, these sounds and different things taking place. And so in this perspective of, of John, though, the Holy Spirit moved upon this baby that before even being born, he jumped for joy within his mother. As the Holy Spirit came upon him, this flesh, this person recognized and confirmed the Spirit of God within Mary. So I see this picture in the, it's in this dark womb that there's no play, there's there's no understanding in the womb that this this child John not fully conscious yet of life is unaware of what's going on around him. And like us many of us we can feel at times that we are in a very dark place in this world. A place of darkness and uncertainty. Not knowing what everything is about, not knowing what our purpose is about. And in that moment, though, the Spirit of God can come upon us and give us joy. And reading through that, it was something I'd never really 
thought of before. And just this idea of, just as John was in that war, the womb, he was yet to be birthed into the, the purpose that God had called him to. And so oftentimes, us, we're in a place of darkness. We're in a place of uncertainty. The world around us is, is dark and it's uncertain. And God's saying, I want to push you out there to be light. I want to push you out there to shine and to be me, to be the one that says, prepare the way. The Messiah has come. And even in our places of darkness, even in our places of uncertainty, because we're in a place that's dark, because we're in a place that's uncertain, doesn't mean that God is not preparing to push us out into the things that he is calling us to. And even in we don't have to wait till we're out of the place of darkness or uncertainty to experience the joy in the presence of God. The presence of God is in the unseen, the hidden dark places. The other night I was watching a show with my kids. Um, my kids, they get on these YouTube channels and stuff. It drives me crazy. So I'm like, hey, we're going to find something I can enjoy too. So we found the National Geographic channel and saw there's Will Smith and science. This has got to be good. So we're watching the show. Will Smith is uh, exploring the ends of the earth, basically. And somehow he got this opportunity to go into a submarine and go to the bottom of the sea where only a handful of people have ever gone. Did you know more people have been in space than have been at the bottom of the ocean? That's crazy. Anyway, that's a side note, my ADD kicking in there. But anyway, so as they're descending down, it just gets darker and darker and darker. And there seems to be nothing. And so then the, the, the captain of the, the submarine, he says, all right, now I want you to close your eyes. And he flips off all the lights. It's complete dark. I mean, the darkest of dark. No light from the sun can trans get down to the bottom depths. And he said, close your eyes, and he flashes a strobe on his submarine. And he has them open their eyes, and they don't really see anything. And he has them close their eyes again, he flashes the strobe again, and they open up, and all of a sudden, the sea is illuminated with all of these different, uh, be all these different creatures that are in the thing that emanate light. And I just thought, what a beautiful picture that in the darkest places, in the darkest moments of our life, there is life and there is light because the Spirit of God is there. The Spirit of God creates and brings life even in the midst of the darkest, unseen places of our lives. The Spirit of God stirs within us joy as we recognize and accept who Jesus is. Joy leapt within baby John because the Spirit of God said, hey, he just knew this is God in flesh. This is the promised one. Mary sensed the Holy Spirit within her. She knew and she received Mary. She received uh, the, what the angel had told them and joy filled her. Mary received the word of who Jesus was and accepted it and joy filled her. And no matter what our situation is, when we recognize, accept, and receive who Christ is, all the hope and the promises that come with that, joy fills us. Because joy is not a result of things being the way we think they ought to be. There were a lot of people that thought the Messiah, the promised king, should, should be birthed into a palace. He should be riding a, uh, quote, Shrek, a wild stallion, baby. You know, he should be coming in on this big stallion, swinging swords, and, and coming in military prowess and overthrowing the Romans. Yet he came to this poor, unknown girl. This was not how people thought the Messiah should come into the world. And a lot of times our happiness rises and falls in. We're happy, we're not happy. There's things in this world I'm not happy about. Anyone not happy this week? If you're married, you probably were happy and not happy all at the same time this week. It just happens. But there is a joy that can well within us that despite the ebbs and flows of life, we can have this constant anchoring joy within our souls. Because joy is a state of being, a place of being that looks for, sees, accepts, and delights in the goodness and light of God, despite the world or our situations not being how we would like them to be. When we find ourselves in a situation, in a world 
It is not as we would like it to be. Things are not as how we would like it to be. That in that moment we are to, as Paul said, think upon those things that are pure and holy. Think upon the things that are good. We are to think upon Christ, his goodness, his promises. Our joy in, in Christ is often a result of our perspective a respective perspective of who he is in relationship to this world. But before we came into the Advent season, we were going through the first part of the book of Revelation. The big thing we saw over and over again is that Jesus was God in flesh and he sits on his throne. And so we do not have to fear anything in this world. That he wins. We win with him. And so we hold on to that perspective. So are we seeing this world through our own shattered lens and limited perspective? Uh, if you go through this life, you're going to get smacked in the face with life's tree branches, and it's going to crack your lenses, your cultural lenses, and things are going to seem fuzzy and not clear and not make sense. And in those moments, we need to take those off and not look at the world, not look at God through our broken humanity, but look at our situation, look at the world, look at God through the lens of Christ. Are we looking at this world through the lens of Christ and the perspective of the kingdom of God? Joy, peace, hope are connected together and arise out of knowing and trusting the goodness of God. God is good and he is faithful. His mercies endure forever. If we allow ourselves to see, accept, and trust the goodness of God, the fullness of who Jesus is and what he has done and is doing, and the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit within us, then we see and understand the world differently. Instead of seeing the world and being filled with despair, we begin to see the world and be filled with hope and joy. Because we know who's on the throne. We know that his purposes do not fail. We do not have to live in fear. And when we begin to see and understand the world differently through the eyes of Christ, we see with hope, we rest in peace, and we are strengthened with joy. And it's something God in the last year has been echoing in my mind a lot. From the passage, the joy of the Lord is my strength, and we're going to look at that. And in those moments when things are dark and uncertain, and maybe you've had those moments, and I had that moment I shared with you uh, last week uh, was one of the more challenging, or the week before last week, was one of the most challenging weeks in my ministry and, and life at the loss of a dear friend. Sunday I preached on hope. Sunday night, a very seemingly hopeless thing took place. So Monday, I, I was a wreck, and I was trusting God, and it was just God's grace. We, we do. We have to take those moments where we just pause. Um, if, if you ever, as a Christian, you're like, I'm not feeling very joyful. I'm such a bad... There's moments in life, your joy gets knocked out of you. You get that wind knocked out of you. And it's in those moments that it's so important to just rest, to rest in the presence of God. So I did what I needed to do, and I took a long three-hour holy nap. Sometimes we just need to pray and close our eyes and let God. And be there and, and mourn through it and Christ is with us. And, and Tuesday morning, I can only explain as miraculous, I woke up Tuesday. After Monday, wailing loud enough the neighbors probably could hear. Tuesday, I woke up and I felt like all the shattered pieces of my heart and mind were just glued together by the Holy Spirit. And I felt hope. And as I met with the, the family members of uh, my friend and we prepared uh, John's funeral, as we talked and just heard what God had been doing in his life and what God was doing in ours, I left there with joy. And in that joy, I felt my strength return. So I want us to read Isaiah. I'm going to go through a couple Old Testament things here, but Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25 through 31. 
To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. Just to, yeah, just go into this. Ask the Holy One. Look up into the heavens who created all the stars. He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. So, O oh, children of God, O oh, child of God, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O oh, child of God, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fail in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The NET says in verse 31 this way, but those who wait for the Lord's help find renewed strength. We are to wait, to trust in him, take holy naps in his presence, and they will rise up as if they had eagles' wings. They run without growing weary. They walk without getting tired. It was a messianic promise the telling of what Christ, how he would fill us and strengthen us. And I love that waiting upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And what kind of strength? Not the strength of the world, but the strength that Christ brings, the strength that Christ came with. And we see this kind of strength uh, depicted in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9 through 10. So just to give you some context, God's people had been in captivity in Babylon. They got permission to go back to Jerusalem. They were rebuilding things. Nehemiah was the governor. Ezra was a priest and a scribe, and he was teaching all of God's laws that the people had forgotten. They had forgotten what God wanted for them. And as he's reading it, they were like, holy shnikes. And they began weeping, and they began crying because they realized they had missed the mark so bad. And so in the midst of their weeping, in the midst of their crying out to God, save us, we have, we have blown it. God speaks this. Verse 9, the Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this. For today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before the Lord. Don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. As we wait and trust in God and who he is, as we accept, receive, All who he is, his joy and his strength rises within us. True joy comes from knowing God and placing our hope and trust in him. The more time we spend in the presence of God, the more we will know him and the more we will trust him. So I just want to encourage us as I conclude this morning. It's a busy time. We're running around doing this and that, making delicious Christmas cookies Getting those gifts, if you have, uh, so any absent-minded uh, men or women here, as you're focusing on the kids, if you have a spouse or significant others, don't forget them. Don't wait till the last day. But we're so busy, we're rushing around. I'm actually ahead of the game. Don't tell Pastor Hillary. But we can spend so much time rushing around and trying to figure things out and trying to make things work, trying to make sense, trying to make it that we forget that we just need to stop And rest, wait upon the Lord. And he renews us. It's him who renews us. It's him that turns joy. And so if you show me a believer who is lacking in joy, I will show you a believer who has not been spending time with Christ. If you show me a believer who's lacking in joy and is full of fear, I will show you a believer who is trusting in their own wisdom, their own strength, their own might, rather than Christ's. 
and I've been there myself, it's not fun. But don't weep. Don't mourn. Turn to God. He is faithful. And as we rest and celebrate, recognize, accept who he is and allow his joy to fill us. Worship team, if you would join me in this moment. So I just want to encourage us this week, spend time with Jesus in prayer, meditating, reflecting upon his words. The more we know him, the greater we will experience his joy, that joy that comes from knowing and living in the truth and the fullness of who he is. So if you would stand with me, I just want to pray. Uh, Paul wrote in the book of Romans this little prayer, and I just want to pray that this morning over us. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit.